Good evening, and welcome to Law Talk, the show that brings the law, the current news, and the Constitution to you each month. Tonight, James Barrett and Mark Malakowski have three interesting subjects for you. Mark, what are we starting with? We're starting with Aaron Brockovich. That would be the Aaron Brockovich that uh, Julia Roberts made famous in the, uh, the Aaron Brockovich movie. Is that correct? That's right. Uh, in, that, in that case, what happened was that uh, everyone always knew that chromium plus six, a certain type of chromium, was, uh, was poison if you breathed it in, right? But no one is really sure about what happens if you drink it with water. Oh, and out of the groundwater. Out of the groundwater. And so this case was about drinking out of groundwater and the deleterious effects it well, had on people. Is, if I remember the uh, the facts of this matter, it was in Hinkley, California, and PG&E had these cooling towers that kept the water cool so they could run their turbines for the power generation of a good portion of California out of that area. And what they use is they use this hexavalent chlorine or chr chrome, chromine, chromium, yeah, chromium, chromium. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Just call uh, it chrome plus six. <laughs> Exactly. Chrome plus six. And they use this to uh, help keep the, keep the cooling towers cool, and they had it in the water. But the problem was it corroded the pipes, it, and, and then it leaked into the groundwater. And, it, and the hexavalent had been used for 30 years to do this. So it, it's, it pretty much saturated the groundwater all over Hinkley. And as a result of that, people started having cancer clusters. Well, I think the, the chromium plus six was, was used to... Uh, you know, keep the water in good condition so it was a good coolant. Um, I think they may have had some ponds or something like that, and those might have, they have, you know, maybe had some clay ponds, and maybe there was some infusion through there. But anyway, somehow or another, uh, somehow or another the chromium plus six got in the groundwater, and that had a, had a bad effect on the local population. When you, when you talk about this chemical, does, is it a, uh, is, is it such a pollutant to groundwater that it becomes dangerous to anyone that consumes it? Well, like I said, at that time, it wasn't really, science wasn't really clear. Everyone knew that you're breathing it as a vapor was bad for you, but it hadn't really been, you know, hashed out what it did if you drank it. So then they found out later that, yeah, it does have a bad effect on you if you're drinking it. Okay, and so, but Aaron Brockovich kind of stumbled onto this case. The, uh, the movie actually portrays the Julia Roberts as Aaron Brockovich, and I understand that Steven Sonnenberg kept uh, his movie almost directly to the facts of the original Aaron Brockovich's case. And, as, and I understand Aaron Brockovich was hired by a law firm to be a simple law clerk. And during a pro bono project, she stumbled onto this health, this health crisis where there was actually a cancer, a cancer niche. Cluster, yeah. Yeah, cancer cluster near Hinkley. And so what happened after that? Well, they, they went forward with the lawsuit, and uh, they were eventually successful. I understand that the, as a result of that lawsuit, this was the largest direct action lawsuit award, and I believe they got like $333 million. But is it really that the, the cancer cluster was a direct result of the contamination of the hexavalent, or was it because it was a contributing factor and they just applied the, the, the fact that it existed and, and came from PG&E's uh, percolating ponds or whatever, and was that where they got it, or was it actually what caused the cancer cluster? Well, it's always interesting with cancer because it doesn't have a sign on it saying, you know, this is what caused me. So what you kind of do is you look at statistical variances in the community, you know, and, and what else they were doing, and then they, they came up with some, you know, significant uh, determinations that this, this hex variant chrome, you know, was likely the cause, more likely than not. Well, I understand what was the main, one of the main factors that, that PG&E was facing was the fact that they actually tried to hide the fact that the hexavalent was in the ground, and they actually gave out flyers saying it's good for you, it's a mineral, and all of this. So, and they tried to get everyone to sign off releases in advance without any consulting any attorneys. So actually, I, is it possible that just because of PG&E's acts and the fact that there was cancer, uh, that... that looked to be related to this chemical, that the award was so large? Well, you know, you have a jury, and the jury always responds to, you know, the evidence and a certain emotional content, too. So, yeah, if, if it looked like, you know, somebody knew about it and they persisted, that would make the jury a lot more sympathetic to the plaintiff, yeah. So, if it, if it, so is it possible, though, that because the PG&E tried to be deceptive 
uh, throughout their interaction with the with the uh, members of the community that were in the cancer cluster that you think that was part of the reason that that award was so large well that could that would be used by the plaintiff to kind of kind of you know paint them in a in a, in a real uh, real negative negative light okay well I, the reason why we bring up Erin Brockovich tonight is a different reason. And we bring this up because she actually has a television show that's called, uh, I believe, Final Justice. And as a result of that show, she investigates uh, a lot of environmental issues and a lot of public, uh, public uh, outcry issues. So why are we really talking about Erin Brockovich tonight? Well, the, the, the kind of the joke was that, you know, back in the, uh, you know, 17th century, 18th century, people used, you know, beer because you couldn't drink the water and it was safer to drink beer or wine than it was the water, so maybe this was an environmental thing, but <laughs> Aaron, Aaron apparently was accused of, of imbibing alcoholic beverages and uh, either piloting a boat or docking a boat or undocking a boat or something like that. Isn't this the, the matter where a game warden actually saw her slapping her husband he, the game warden witnessed her throwing a cell phone, and then he wanted to investigate this, and the boat was actually at the dock, tied to the dock at the time? Well, according to the, to the I think the, the law enforcement reports, it was something like she was having trouble docking the boat, and she had slurred speech. So that's kind of what they, you know, their official story was. Well, how did they determine she had slurred speech? Did they actually try to confront her because she was having problems docking the boat? Yeah, I think a game warden went up and talked to her. Was she sitting by the dock of the bay? Yeah, she was sitting by the dock <laughs> of Lake Lake Mer. I think it was Lake. Uh, I think what lake? It was. Wasn't it Lake was, Havasu? Was it? It was Lake. Uh, geez. Um, Crater Lake. No, no, no. It was Lake Mead. Lake, <laughs> lake Mini, Mead. Lake Mead. Okay, so this is not Julia Roberts who got in trouble. It's the real. It's the real <laughs> Eric Eric Brockovich and uh, Aaron Brockovich. And so yeah, it was Lake Mead, Nevada, and uh, accused of operating a boat while intoxicated at Lake Mead. Okay. Um, to notice signs she was intoxicated, including surf speech, while she struggled to dock her boat. That's, and then she was above the .08. Oh well, wait, I mean, .08. I, that, I understand that's the legal limit right. for driving, but how does that affect you on a boat? Well, but they have drunk boating as well. They've got drunk driving. Drunk boating. Yeah, you can be drunk boating. Yeah. Okay. Now, d drunk boating. Do you have to be driving the boat, or do you have to just be in the boat? Well, it's a funny thing because. Even with a, with a vehicle, a motor vehicle on the land, even with a car or a motorcycle, you don't necessarily have to be driving to get a drunk driving. I understand that you, if, even if you're in the car and the keys are not ignition, but they're in your pocket, you can get a drunk driving. Yeah, I think it's, you know, in California, I'm not sure about other states, but if it's in the passenger compartment, the prosecutor's going to argue that you're, you're in control of the vehicle. And you still have access to the keys, which means at any time you could start the car up and start driving away and then obviously drive while intoxicated. Well, what they're saying is that you were just too drunk to get the keys in the ignition. You were trying, but you couldn't. <laughs> you know, so that's what the prosecutor's going to say. All right, so, so Aaron Brockovich... Uh, I mean, you, what, can have them, you can have them in the trunk, though. You'd probably be okay you, in the trunk. Well, if they're in the trunk and away from you... Yeah, yeah, if you can't reach them. Okay, yeah. what, I've heard the story that if the, car, the keys are outside of the car, is that the same as in the trunk? I think you, I think that, yeah, it, it, you, know, you can put them on the left front tie or something like that. Yeah. Okay, well, what are, where are Aaron Brockovich's keys to the boat? I, I don't know. We don't, we don't have the, all the facts of this case, and we don't know. Some boats, you don't even need a key, you know. Sometimes. Yeah, so that means you push a button, you yeah, get maybe, going, right? Maybe you push a button, so it's hard to say. Well, I'm, I'm disappointed in Aaron Brockovich um, because I, I know a lot of people look up to her. I actually really respect uh, the, the whole background, her background, um, and I do respect the fact what she did with PG&E, but... The fact of being on a dock and intoxicated, unless she was driving the boat, she, that's one thing. And how could the game warden see her driving the boat if she's at the dock? Well, the question is, in my mind, I'm not really sure of the facts of the case. Now, whether she was coming back, I mean, when, when the report I read, it sounded like she was coming back and having trouble docking the boat, okay. which means she'd have been driving the boat. Maybe she's observed driving it. Other, uh, other recitations of the facts are that she, they hadn't taken off yet. Okay. So, well, I think what we need to do is watch how that plays out. I think we should move on to our second subject tonight. I understand we're covering uh, some of the issues about the IRS and a Lois Lerner. Well, yeah, Lois Lerner um, was in charge of, the, I guess, the 501c, you know, uh, tax-exempt, you know, political organization kind of uh, 
you know, uh, social welfare kind of thing where a lot of people use that as part of the campaign. And um, apparently there was four or five or 600 uh, conservative groups that were targeted. And plus they asked the donors and also Romney donors. They went after, you know, the IRS pressured them. And from about 2010 to 2012. Well, what, what, so, um, what, so, wasn't it the Tea Party, though? Well, it was tea, well, wasn't it primarily targeted well, at the Tea Party? Well, it was Tea Party, but it was other conservative donors. And uh, so there was, you know, was somewhere, somewhere in the other 400 of those groups. And they did actually do equal uh, attacks on the liberal groups, but they only, uh, but the numbers on that have only come to four or five or six. Yes. So yeah. even though they did look into some liberal groups, it seems like, the ratio is somewhere 50 to 1. But you know, maybe those numbers will be hashed out once there's a trial. Well, I understand um, that they were but targeting. But we, we, we really haven't seen, any, we haven't seen any discovery because the FBI forgot about the case. Oh, that's they, right. They forgot about it. They forgot. <laughs> so they, they didn't even know who they, they assigned yeah, to look so at right. the case, right? So, I mean, we haven't really seen any discovery. We haven't seen any testimony. We don't, we don't really know anything about it except from what reports are. It was like 50 to 1 or, you know, you know uh, conservative liberal groups who were being... Um, basically stymied so they couldn't operate politically. Yeah. Well, I understand that the you reason know, the we talk about before, Lois Lerner is because Lois the... Lerner was actually under oath and she was supposed to, she came to the, to Congress right, the to committee, provide yeah. information for the IRS over the, over this, this potential catastrophe for the IRS and she did something unique. What did she do? Well, she took the fifth, but she took it in a pretty strange way. Wait a minute. If you take the fifth, you're supposed to enunciate the Fifth Amendment before you open your mouth and say one word, and you're not supposed to be talking to the investigators uh, and then say, I'll take the fifth. So from what I remember was Lois Lerner decided to give a speech. Well, she, she proclaimed her innocence. Uh, and now generally, um, now I think the fifth should be much stronger than it is. But I'm just saying if you're looking procedurally, what a prosecutor would argue is that if you proclaim your innocence, she said, well, I didn't break any law, I didn't break any regulation. I mean, that leads that, those statements lead her open to a cross-examination. Well, right? wait a minute. If to a lot of facts. If she starts telling the congressional group that are asking her questions that she's innocent and she broke no laws, she didn't just open the door. She threw the barn door open ready to drive the car out the door because then the congressional investigators would have the ability to ask her on every last question related to breaking federal law, breaking the codes of the IRS, and on top of that, what was her exact activities? Because she says, I didn't do anything wrong. Well, okay, if you didn't do anything wrong, what did you do, Ms. Yeah, Hunter? so I mean, you know, if she had said something, well, I didn't, you know, drive my car on September 3rd from here to the Speedy Mart, then they could question her about that. They'd, that be, limited. It'd They'd be, be limited. They'd be limited, right? But to make a broad statement that, you know, I didn't break any law, I didn't break any regulation, that's, that's opening the door quite a bit. So, and also, then it comes the question as well, did anything she she talked about, would that open her to criminal prosecution? I mean, is there anything in any of those things? Well, yeah, there would be, um, you know, if you're revealing co uh, confidential tax information, the IRS is not supposed to give away information that people give in their taxes. Well, those are federal felonies yeah, if you to, talk to, about the privacy issues of, right. a, of a taxpayer. And so the, what happened, all those names and donors and all that information was given to the Democratic Party so they could use that in the, in the election, in the presidential election. And so... That's th those. That's definitely breaking a law. So well, there's that actually something it. bigger here because after the beating the uh, of 210 <laughs> and the the election of a, a <coughs> substantial amount of Republicans in both the House and the Senate, right. they wanted to make sure that didn't happen at the 2012 election. Well, so that's it's kind of it's yeah. kind of strange how the timing was on all of these these uh, 503s. That had the word Tea five, Party. I think, I think it was five hundred one C. Yeah, yeah and they had the Tea Party right. or you know no language about progressives. Anything that had to do anything with a conservative a conservative position. And well, but when you look at it, you know if you have the full force of the IRS working for one party to change the results of a presidential election, you know that's pretty important because the IRS is pretty strong. And if they spend two years, you know, working. A, as part of the campaign. Oh, by you know, yeah, one oh, of the part, part of the campaign. <laughs> you know, oh, that's part of the campaign. The ca they're on the campaign. You know, that, that can have an, it may have had an influence on the election, maybe not, but you would think that it could if they went to, you know, 400, uh, 400 groups that never 
got any money, never did any. He means ad. stymied their yeah, ability yeah, to get like, money, to get donations, so I mean, to you know, be able I mean, to be. You're, you're talking about the brunt of the federal government being used to influence the presidential campaign. Well, I got yeah. a question. Do you believe the presidential campaign in 212 was uh, affected by this uh, this oppressive IRS action against all of these conservative groups? Well, it's kind of like it's kind of like uh, who was the guy who ran all, won all the bike races? Oh, uh, Lance Armstrong. Okay, would he have won if he didn't take steroids? We'll never know. We don't know. So the same thing with the 212. We'll never know. We'll just but, never know. But it seemed a little it seems a little coincidental that after the 210 elections <laughs> that uh, when uh, when the Tea Party was such an effective grassroots organization generally and all these new 5013Cs are coming out and they're heading they're they're getting all ready in fact it was funny because the Tea Party kind of fell off the map after the 210 election. We always thought, well, they just kind of disbanded because of this. But they didn't disband. What happened was the IRS was turned on high gear. But you know what's interesting? The IRS was saying it was a one rogue agent out of Cincinnati that or had two, done two, two, two rogue agents, two, in a, uh, two, two in rogue room. IRS agents yeah. out of Cincinnati that somehow stopped 500 conservative groups from getting their tax exempt status. Is that what really happened, Mark? Well, as it turns out, there was there was more people involved. Oh, more and, than Cincinnati. And and, uh, and so we don't really know how far it goes. Uh, but the, you know, some people, you know, there were statements that once the Cincinnati people kind of had it pinned on them, they said, well, you know, Washington D.C. was telling us what to do, and so on and so forth. So but, you, what? Are you trying to tell me the people in Cincinnati weren't going to take the fall? Well, we don't, like I said, the investigation has basically fallen off the map because the FBI forgot about it. The FBI forgot, forgot about, about it. it. So, you know. But wh why isn't Congress called Lerner back? I understand she was suspended after that uh, infamous taking the fifth. She was suspended with pay. By the way, she makes uh, almost 200000 a year. She was suspended with pay. And now she's just sitting at home, uh, you know, doing whatever she does on the, on the side. Uh, and that seems a little odd. Well, I don't think it's that odd. I mean, I, what, what happened is, you know, there's, she has a long history, you know, in, a, in various government positions of influencing elections. She's been doing this for many years. And, you know, she's put pressure on candidates not to run and under, well, the, under various things. I, she was in the, uh, you know, in, in different things. But when you look in the, in the broader thing, there's also something interesting. If you look at Salinas versus Texas, okay? Yeah. Now, that's kind of a groundbreaking case. And in that case, it was five to four Supreme Court of the United, of the United States. There was no arrest, no Miranda rights given, and uh, there was a party, and someone got, a couple guys got shot with a shotgun, mm -hmm. and uh, so they went to Salinas, and they said, well, can we take a look at your shotgun? He said, yeah, the cops, you can have my shotgun, and then, um, you know, then they started asking about him. They said, well, come on down to the police station, you know, and just to say hi, and, they, and then they asked him, would the gun match the shells from the scene of the, the, the crime? Yeah, or the well, scene of the murder. I, and, yeah. all of, and all of a sudden, he got real quiet. He stopped talking. He shuffled his feet, bit his lip. And uh, so basically, you know, the cops said, he well, said that, that was taking the fifth? Well, they said that was an uncomfortable reaction, right? Okay. And so then um, the question was, could you bring this behavior up and the refusal to answer at trial? Right. And so a Justice uh, 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 Alito, Alito. Alito, all right, and he said, well, he was free to leave. He didn't invoke his rights. And so... Um, he doesn't really get his Fifth Amendment rights. They can talk about the fact he didn't testify, the fact that he's, he was acting kind of funny there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's really interesting here. And, you know, and this goes back to Lois Lerner. You know, I, I, I don't think that she did the most, the wisest thing. You know, if she's going to plead the fifth, she just pled the fifth. Here is kind of the flip side. This guy doesn't say anything. He just stays silent. And they still say he didn't get the fifth. So okay. there's, a, there's well, the magic. Well, I think what we need to do. But there's the magic words we talked about before, right? I'm supposed to say I want to talk to my attorney. Yeah, right. And speaking of talking to our attorney, we should go on to the next subject, which is uh, a state and gift tax, the new law they passed, and that would be the American, what's the American tax Relief? Pay, tax Taxpayer Relief, pay relief, relief Act. Act. Okay. And, w and this was passed in 212, but nobody really heard about it. No, no, this was, I think it was right at the beginning of two. Well, it was, it was brought up in the end of 212, and then it was finally signed on right. in January of 213. Right. And what's unique about this is that uh, given all the rhetoric that's come out of the, uh, the administration about the rich people have too much money and this, this actually helps people that have money. Can you tell me what it does? Well, okay, we had the fiscal cliff. So it was kind of a showdown of all the government. And at that time, um, you had a lifetime exclusion of 5.12 million, right? 
Now, what they were saying, if this runs out, okay, then it's going to revert to $1 million exclusion, and everything after that's going to be a 55% tax, okay? So that would be, you know, pretty, pretty substantial. Pretty substantial change Very substantial. from changing from 5.12 million. Okay, so that let's talk about what that 5.12 million uh, exclusion is. That means over your lifetime, you can gift that much to donees. Okay, over your life, it's a lifetime exclusion. Okay, so that was going to go down to a million, which be would be huge in a lot of cases. Um, but instead, it went up to 5.25 million. Basically, you know, taking account of inflation, I guess, of being bumped up a little. And if you go over the 5.25 million, then you have a 40% tax. Okay, so if your if your tax basis is for an inheritance tax is over 5.25 million, or you burn the exclusion, then everything's at 40% tax. 40, which, it's, that's it's gone tax, up. Yeah. That's up. That's more than it was before. Just, it wasn't at uh, what was it 20%? Because uh, it went up substantially. That's because. Yeah. Well, well, anyway, we're, at, we're right now we're at a 40 percent, and uh, but there are still some saving graces, you know, in, in addition to the 5.25 million. Um, if you if you with your spouse, there's unlimited deductions for transfers between spouses. Oh, okay. Why the spouse is a lot. Okay. okay. And so your state and gift tax are, are kind of um, held down as long as that spouse is alive. So you can do transfer as long as that uh, spouse is a U.S. citizen. Okay, so what you're saying is the spouse can actually use some of the exclusion for their spouse. Uh, say, say husband, wife, they both have the 5.25 million exclusion, correct? Well, they can do a transfer during their lifetime. Right. That you know that gives them uh, relief until that spouse dies, and then you have to get down to the brass tax of how much is left. Now, there's another thing that's a little bit more complex. And what is that, Mark? That's called portability. Okay. okay. Can you explain that to our audience? I, okay. I, portability is, sounds like something you don't normally throw into a tax code. <laughs> okay. So you can add the unused power portion of your spouse's exclusion to your own. So um, you could you could actually transfer you know that 10.5 million onto your descendants or your your oh, beneficiaries. Oh, you mean your beneficiaries, your beneficiaries from your yeah. estate can yeah. actually inherit that. As long as you very carefully, you handle everything very carefully. You have to file your, your tax return within nine months, and you have to be very careful, you know, after the, the death of the first spouse. But you can, get, you can recover that 5.25 if it was unused. Well, you know, that, that's pretty exciting in many ways because there are a lot of families. I'm sure there's uh, up to 5% of the people in the country could actually utilize this. I know that it's not, there's a the vast majority of people who can't use this because that's a lot of money. Right. Um, but with the idea of portability, what you're saying is, technically speaking, you could have one spouse left with $10.5 million of with exclusions. Is that correct? Right, right. So that means if they have beneficiaries, they could literally give away the $10.5 million, and there'd be no taxes on those, uh, those no gifts. Est no estate tax. No estate tax on those mm -hmm. gifts. Yeah. But doesn't that take away from what the, the estate tax has been really promoted over the years, is that, oh, the, you, you die, and so you're supposed to give a bunch of your money back to the government because you've got to help the rest well, of the country? Well, there's other ways. We're not going to get into the, the intricacies of it, but there's ways that you can run into other, other, uh, you know, other taxes as well. But in the broad brush, what this does, you know, starting at the beginning of this year, is that you have you know transfer between spouses? You have portability. You have a goes up to 5.25. And there's one other issue that came up. Um, the you can give now you can give fourteen thousand dollars a year uh, per donee oh, as a okay. gift. So that and that and that doesn't go into your 5.25. That doesn't go into your lifetime. Okay, those are the gifts that you can give out every year right. to any number of people that you want to give fourteen thousand. And those don't add against the 5.25 million. Right, right. Okay. And also, if you're married, that could be 28,000 per year per donee. Well, do you? Let's go back for a minute. The Bush tax cuts that everyone keeps complaining about included the estate tax, where they effectively wiped it out. They said well, you're not going to have to pay estate tax anymore because because they didn't believe that that was a fair for the people that were transferring wealth between generations. So now we're back up to 40 percent above 5.25 million which effectively covers the majority of the people in the country, right? Okay, so, but that 40% for the people that are above that amount, that sounds like a lot of money, Mark. Yeah, well, there may be other things you could do. You know, there's other things, there's, there's other mechanisms you could use. Um, you know, there is, there's, there's, you know, family limited partnerships, there's trust, there's diff different things you might be able to do. But in general, that's, 
that's about the, you know that's the, that's that's what you have on your exemption or your exclusion is your 5.25 million. Right? Well, you know the interesting thing is the Rockefellers, the Kennedys, and families like that have been utilizing trusts and limited partnerships and all that for for generations with their offspring because in fact the money may have been earned 50 years ago and now we're talking great 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 grandchildren are getting the benefit of their income from that long ago through through vehicles where there's not really taxes paid there's no reduction mm. in the principles and possibly you know if there's an estate tax code you would think that some of that would be drawn off but that's what people always talk about when they talk about estate tax the very wealthy well, I'm just saying that uh, you know you're not necessarily going to be immune from taxes. I mean, you're gonna you're gonna face tax liabilities, uh, no matter how you handle things. But there's some ways that you can do it to improve your in, improve the way that it that it goes forward. For example, you know, a, your normal estate plan is going to include maybe a declaration of trust for you know if you're going to do a trust, you know, a pour over will, you know, a durable power of attorney or a springing power of attorney, you know, advanced health care director. So you have an estate plan. That can kind of uh, you know do the transfer. At least you av you avoid probate, and uh, you know makes that that process a little simpler too. Yeah, well, but you but you but you, always, but you always have to deal with taxes. Well, doesn't that <laughs> isn't that kind of the main rationale behind um, trust to begin with? Is to ensure that you can pass your the race of the estate to the beneficiaries with as limited taxes as possible. Well, it's more to avoid probate. Yeah. Well, the probate, there's probate fees yeah. that go along with that, and probate... So if you can, because, you know, if you go through probate, you have an executor, right, right, and then you have an attorney, and they're going to get a statutory amount, you know, of fees through right. that. Right. And also, it's a long, involved process. Right. With a trust, you don't have to pay for the executor, you don't have to pay for the attorney, uh, not, a, not the statutory fee at any rate, and the process is, is a little more streamlined. Okay. But what you're doing is you're, you're lining it out a little more... Uh, carefully so there's not as much, you know, the, the Declaration of Trust kind of lines out a lot of things that get decided as you go through probate. Okay, well on that note, I think we're going to be done with the show tonight. And I wanted to thank you for joining us for Law Talk. And I'll tell you, for Mark and myself, James Barrett, I will wish you a nice evening. And so what about this probate anyway? Well, I mean, there's statutory <laughs> fees with probate. And, there's, and, they, and who makes the money on that? Attorneys. And you well, know, the I've done probate. You've done the probate. probate you there's also that. there's also the executor, too. Yeah, and executor the executor gets executor fees. But I I think the executors work pretty hard. Actually. Well, exec. Well, if they.